Today is the 7th of February, 2010. We are at the American Legion Post in Margaretville, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and date and place of birth, please? My name is George Maggio. Date of birth, 525-49-1949. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Did you attend school in Brooklyn? Yes, I did. And uh, did you graduate from high school in Brooklyn? Yes, I did. What year did you graduate? 1969, I would say. 68, 69. And at that point, uh, did you go into the service or did you go on to college? No, nope, was drafted. You were drafted? Yes, sir. And whereabouts uh, did you go for your basic training? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. You were drafted into the Army? Right. And uh, what was basic like for you? Well, basic was, um, I guess, it was pretty tough, but you had fun, too, while you were doing with the training. They really mm -hmm. trained you to become a man. They broke you down, and then they built you back up the way they wanted you. Mm -hmm. That's the way was it, it your first time away from home? Yes. And did you uh, take basic with anybody you knew, anybody from the neighborhood or from Brooklyn? No, but there were other people from Brooklyn, but I didn't know. No one you knew. Right. And... Uh, when did you graduate from basic training? Joined in January, I guess. Probably March sometime. March, March, April, yeah. Did you go on to an advanced school at that point? Yes, I did. And where was that? Fort Benning, Georgia. And what kind of training did you receive there? They had me as a radio repairman and operator, 32 Bravo, my MOS was. And how long was that school? That school was eight, nine weeks. After you uh, graduated, were you posted any place in the States or were you shipped overseas? Well, they gave me 20-something days leave, and then after that I went overseas. I was going to uh, Vietnam, mm -hmm. and then I went to Seattle, Washington. They transferred my orders to Korea. Korea. Right. And how did you get to Korea? We flew. I flew out of Seattle, Washington, landed in uh, Tokyo, Japan, and then from there right into uh, Seoul, Korea. Was it a commercial flight or military? It was commercial up until we reached Japan, then, you know, then it went, you know, like almost military, you might mm -hmm. as say. And when did you land in Korea? Let me see. Boy, and it had to be in, in June. June of 69. Yep, June of 69. And what was your impression uh, when you stepped off the plane? What was the weather like? Well, it was hot, muggy, mm -hmm. you know. I thought I was in the asshole of the world, to be honest. You know, it was that bad, you know. <laughs> any, any odd smells or anything there? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. You could smell manure. Basically, uh, probably was, it's basically human manure because with the rice paddies they had over there mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and the animals, the oxes, i never seen anything like it. Did you receive any in-country orientation? Yes, they did. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. They told us, you know, what to expect, and then they told us what companies and battalions we were going to, and the other thing, and they, and, they were, and they gave us our shots as soon as we got in there. All right. After that, uh, where did they send you? They sent me to the DMZ, mm -hmm. which was like between, well, the DMZ, 38 parallel, mm -hmm. and I was up there for the duration. I was on patrols inside the DMZ zone. Mm -hmm. I could see North Korea, and I could see the North Koreans. They infiltrated, and we used to have firefights, you know, this and that, every uh, so often. What, what unit did they assign you to? I was with the uh, 2nd Battalion, 9th Infantry Division, Mechanized. Mm -hmm. And what kind of weapon were you issued? I was issued an M79. An M79 grenade launcher? Correct. You didn't have a side ar arm or a rifle? No, I had an M16, but I never used it. It was the M79. That's what they gave me, mm -hmm. and that's what I used. Did you carry ammunition at all times? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. when we were up in the zone. And we used to do patrols and, you know, watch the fence. At nighttime was the worst part. Of course, you didn't sleep. They had loudspeakers going and talking mm -hmm. through the whole night, telling us, you know, propaganda, what are we doing here, you know. And this was all from the North Koreans? Yes. Did we retaliate with any sort of propaganda? Uh, not that I know of that, you know, because uh, the only thing we did was just 
patrol the fence, or like I did, go inside the fence mm -hmm. and go on patrol. We had guard posts in there, and uh, you'd be in there for 30 days straight, you know, and mm -hmm. you would just do patrols through the area. What were your living quarters like there? Forget <coughs> about it. The living quarters. We lived in, um, basically, it was all sandbags. It was underground. But so you lived the in GP. bunkers? Yeah, bunkers, yeah. It was underground bunkers. And that's in the, in the daytime. We would fill sandbags and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. do things like that, and just keep the guard post and check to see what they were doing if anybody was infiltrating. But most of the infiltration went during the evening, mm -hmm. as soon as the sun went down, you know, and that was it. Gee, it sounds almost like uh, like Vietnam. To be honest with you, it, it was uh, Vietnam. So when mm -hmm. I left there, you know, from uh, when I was coming there, I was going to Vietnam, and then they switched me to Korea because radio operators were a dime a dozen. That's what they needed. Mm -hmm. and that's what they taught me over there. There was no saluting. You couldn't salute no officers. Everybody knew everybody by their first name, mm -hmm. and that's the way we operated. D did your uniforms contain insignia? Uh, yes, they did. I had the Indian head patch, mm -hmm. which was the 2nd Battalion or 3rd, whatever they wanted to call it. It was 2nd and 9th Infantry Division. Was it subdued or a color patch? It's subdued. Mm -hmm. It was all uh, dark. We didn't have no color patches at all. And, and what kind of... Uh, Fatigues did you have? Did you have the state side or did you have the jungle fatigues? No, they gave us the state side fatigues. State side? The solid green. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you wear a flak vest and helmet? Yes, we did. We mm -hmm. a flak vest helmet. You, uh, you mentioned earlier about getting in some firefights. Yes. Um, yes. Do you want to tell us about what that was like the first time it happened? Well, the first time it happened, I think it was in July or August when I first got there. I was operating uh, up on a, on a mountain. I had um, the light jeep with the radio there, and it was North Korean trying to infiltrate through the fence. And what happened was they told me to put the light on, and I was sh putting a spotlight on. Mm -hmm. Didn't see nothing. Then uh, one of the sergeants turned around and told me to shut it off and wait about 30 seconds to a minute and then hit the light again when he tells me at that one spot. And when I did it, there were North Koreans standing there trying to get through. And then we opened fire. They fired at me with this with the spotlight. But I was inside a mountain mm -hmm. where they couldn't, you know, get a good clear shot to knock the light out. Mm -hmm. But I was new there, and I didn't know nothing about it that they were even doing that. Was there any kind of body count? Uh, yes, we did. We killed a um, North Korean that was infiltrating. There was a couple of them, but we, we just got one. And when we brought him back to Pamun John, mm -hmm. they turned around, they denied it. They said it was a no, no North Korean. They didn't know who it was. So mm. that's the way it ended. That's was, it, it was he in any kind of a military uniform? Uh, basically, in, um, he was, yeah, some kind of uniform, but it was not, you know, it was more or less like, um, <coughs> like a, a greenish uniform. Mm -hmm. But it was something like we, we would be wearing. But it was basically, uh, you could see, it was a different color uniform completely, mm -hmm. and that's the way it was. And he, they were not, but we picked up their guns, which they had uh, traces, well, what do you call it, um, blue traces, I think they green were. Green traces. Yeah, green, blue, blue yeah. What, what kind of weapon did he have? That, I couldn't tell you okay. at that point, because when we got there, I was up on the hill, mm -hmm. and then the lieutenants went down into the, and opened the gate, and they went in there, and they picked mm -hmm. up the body. And, and there were a couple other incidents? Oh, somewhere? yeah, I got into... Um, two firefights when I was on patrol in the DMZ. And first one and the second one both were Americans. Because when I was on patrol at nighttime, what happened was headquarters screwed up where, where they forgot to turn around and say there was going to be a patrol oh. in this area at a certain time. And they start, you know, shooting at us. You so know. you guys were firing back and forth at each other? They fired back at us, and we could tell by the color of the traces that it was Americans, and yeah. uh, got on the radio and told them, you know, where we okay. were. We couldn't pop a flare because, you know, that's sure. the way it was. And then another time, the same thing happened again, but it seemed like it always screwed up somewhere. Mm -hmm. Somebody screwed up, but, mm -hmm. but I guess that's war. So you didn't have any other incidents with uh, the North Koreans? Oh, yeah. Then we had, um, I had an incident where four Americans were killed. That was a tough one uh, where we were on a strike force. Mm -hmm. And what happened was they were going inside the GP. We just got off, mm -hmm. you know. And what happened, they were telling us on the loudspeakers at that time when we killed that North Korean, for that one soldier that we got, that they were going to kill 10 of us in the 2nd and 9th Infantry Division. So while we were up there, we stayed there. And then all of a sudden we got, after a certain period of time, they took us off the DMZ and brought us back. But we still stayed north mm -hmm. of the Indian River. 
and they brought us back. And the day they brought us back, we went on strike force. And the other company that went up took over, and they killed four American soldiers that day. And we had to go back up and get their bodies. Mm. And what happened was we went up there, and um, they shot them with their own weapons, with an M16 right through their head. That was the toughest, you know, day in my life. Mm -hmm. I seen, you know, something you don't expect to see. But, no. You know. Did, did any of this get uh, broadcast back here in the States, or was it kept quiet? It was kept know? quiet. Vietnam was the main thing. Mm -hmm. Vietnam was the main thing. To this day, they still deny a lot of stuff, you mm -hmm. know, but what are you going to do? Even with Agent Orange, if it wasn't for the American Legion saying that it was about 12,000 troops, uh, it was in the July issue, they threw Agent Orange on, on all Yeah, of us. you mentioned that earlier. Do you want to tell us about that? I mean, did, did you know at the time no. you were being sprayed with something? No. Nobody did. You mm -hmm. just had a lot of vegetation, and then all of a sudden, the next day, two days later, there was nothing. Everything was dead. Mm -hmm. You know, they just came over, and they just sprayed it. They flew over. It was done with the uh, Air Force? Yep. And we all got it, you know. But other than that, okay. it wasn't, you know, I had a few lumps of here where they cut off the VA, and they said it's no cancer, this and that, not to worry about it. So I try not to think about it, but mm -hmm. what happens, your nerves get shot after a while. You know, sure. you can't deal. You know. Now, are, are you receiving regular treatments through the Veterans Hospital? Uh, well, let me put it this way. Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. I, I go down there, but I also go to a private doctor, mm -hmm. you know, because I really, you know, you're going to think, there's a, there's a part of me that don't trust, the, you know, the VA, the mm -hmm. government, you know, because they deny too many things all these years, sure. and then all of a sudden, you know, and I, you know, feel that this thing should have been, you know, straightened out years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, Korea, in 1968, I looked up everything, it was considered a war, 68, and then in 69, because there was so much action going over there with guys getting killed, this and that, and they never brought it up. I mean, even me, when I was a radio operator, um, there was an incident in Vietnam, and I don't even know if that was, uh, you know, uh, dated or anything like that. The guys were getting killed in the firefight, and I happened to be in the bunker, and I happened to hear it, and I heard the colonel's radio operator saying, be advised, get off our frequency, you know, the guys were getting shot over there, and you could hear it. And then mm -hmm. I got on, and I switched the frequencies, mm -hmm. then the colonel came up. And he just turned around and he wanted to know who switched all the frequencies for all the companies. And I said, I did, you know. Mm -hmm. And he shook my hand and he said, you know, it was a good job because his, the other guy didn't do it. Mm -hmm. But guys were getting killed over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there was no like, oh, please get off with the frequency, you know. These guys were saying get, you know, and they were swearing sure. and carrying on. Yep. And I listened to it through the whole thing because my captain's name was Rasmussen at the time. And he was a ranger and we listened to it. He was in Vietnam too. And we just listened to it. It was, you know, it's something that's real that mm -hmm. you can't believe. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the whole thing. Okay. Now, um, you were you were there for the winter season. Yes, in Korea. it was. What was that like? Cold as all hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in the Catskills, and there, I still never felt the cold that I felt over there. As it was cold. Now, what about uh, clothing and equipment? Did you feel it was adequate? Uh, yeah, we had Mickey Mouse boots, they called them, and we had parkers, big parkers with the hoods on them. But when you're on patrol, you know, you would freeze. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, because I remember one night being on patrol, and all of a sudden we screwed up, where we, instead of uh, it was Christmas time, we stayed in a, in a cluster, all of us. We figured there was no fighting going on, so we just went out on a patrol in the GP, and North Koreans come about 18 to 20 of them. And they set up on the other side of the road where we were, so we couldn't do nothing except sit there. Mm -hmm. They were spread out. If we would have fired, we all would have been dead. Mm -hmm. You know, we were outnumbered. So, and I froze. I never forget that day. Mm -hmm. And when they got me up, my legs were dead. You know, mm -hmm. from the cold. Now, when you guys were out there, did you have any kind of? When you were out on patrol like that, did you have any kind of? Probably not sleeping bags, but uh, like no, a blanket no, or no. anything. We never had none of that. No. No, we just would stay out, out on the ground. Mm -hmm. and stay like Even that. Even if it was snowing. Even if it was snowing. Mm -hmm. They didn't give us nothing. We just had our recall. Went the gear on. And that's okay. it. The Mickey Mouse boots were the only thing to keep our feet warm. Okay. Now, what, now when you were uh, <clears throat> back in the bunkers, were those bunkers heated at all? Did you have a stove? Yeah, or? yeah we had a stove with kerosene, you know, and that was it. Mm -hmm. You know, we just pour kerosene in and heat them up like that. And that was it. You know, that, that's about what we had in those bunkers. 
What about uh, what about things like uh, rats or snakes? Any problem with with those in the I in never the took notice to it. My mind was on other things than you know rats mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I seen you know mice and stuff like that. I guess you know because we were allowed to have dogs, which I couldn't believe mm -hmm. when I was overseas. You know when we had dog. I had a dog in our company. You know, a couple of guys. We would have dogs, and that was it. Mm -hmm. They would stay with us. Now, what about your food uh, out there? What sea rations? You didn't have any hot chow at all, or not really. And the hot chow that we had really wasn't that hot when huh. it got up to us, and especially in the winter time. Yeah, I used to eat sea rations mostly when we were up on the GP. You know. Okay. And matter of fact, when I came home to the states, was the first time I ate on a dish after being in Korea that long, up in the DMZ. I don't know about the southern part of Korea, but where we were, we had these plastic, you know, things and we used to eat out of, mm -hmm. and sea rations. And when we used to get hot stuff, you know, we used to make our own coffee, and that was it. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, did you have any entertainment over there, like USO yes, shows? Yes, or? yes, I did have one USO show that I went to. I think that was the first uh, Christmas I was there. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, one of the guys from Leave It to Beaver was there, and some girl, you know, dancing up on stage, and that was, you know, uh -huh. and honestly, that's something, you know, that's the only thing I can remember about that, you know. Did Did you have uh, much contact with the uh, civilian population, the South Koreans at all? Yes, when they let us go out, you know, to go into the village, mm -hmm. we used to go into the village, you know, we used to go down to the village, like after we were up on the DMZ so long, we would come back after patrols and then just go out and see what was going on in the DMZ, you know, like in the mm -hmm. village, we would go down there, we would eat, you know. I don't want to say what else was done mm -hmm. down there, drinking, that's sure. what we did, you know, and other stuff. Uh, how were you treated overall by the South Koreans? Do they appreciate uh, you being over there, or what was it like? I say we've got mixed feelings about that, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of them were, were happy to see us there, and then some of them didn't want us there. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the whole thing. They really wanted their, their country to be, you know, united, some of them. Yeah. You know, because you, you couldn't even know, even like the Papa Sons and stuff like that, because when we were there, when I was down there, we used to pay them to do our laundry. Yeah. You know, they used to do the laundry for us, you used to give them so much money out of your pay. And after a while, you didn't know whether to trust them or not. Mm -hmm. You know, as you got, when I went down there, over there, I was young looking. As later on, I got really old looking. I aged. Mm -hmm. And that's what that usually happens. And when the new guys came in and I was getting ready to leave, they looked so young to me. Mm -hmm. But that's the whole thing. Okay. Did you get any kind of R and R while you were there? Uh, no, I didn't go away. The only the only time they gave me, I think, was um, I think I got a, a three day pass to go to Seoul, Korea, mm -hmm. and that was R and R. I never went. You know, it's not like what they do now, like mm -hmm. in Iraq and all that. They die six months and they could come back to the states. I didn't have that. We we did our full tour of duty there. Which it was one year. One year? Yep, okay. and then I extended it to two, I think two more months, so I get 14 months in there, so I could get five months early out combat zone, Okay. and that's what I did, and stayed there. All right, and uh, when did you leave Korea? I left Korea around, I guess, August 30th, and I was in the United States September 1st when I got out. It was mm -hmm. saying September. Where right? were you discharged from? Fort Lewis, Washington. Mm -hmm. They gave us a steak dinner when we landed, french fries, whatever we wanted, milk, this and that. Matter of fact, when we flew out of there, we went from there to Japan again. One of the engines was no good. We had to get another engine for the jet, so we had a layover. And then we had the guys with Vietnam. We all came home in our fatigues, mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam and North, you know, Korean, so, you know, all the guys. We all were together. We didn't come home in dress uniforms. We all came home in our, what do you call Your fatigues. Your fatigues. Yep. Okay. That was the way it did. All right. And um, any incidents at the airports at all coming coming back? No, no. The only incidents we had was the jet, okay. which was um, uh, one of the Army, I guess, the thing where the engine just kept on acting up. And then we had, when we got out of Tokyo, we went ready to go to Seattle, Washington. Another engine went out. It was a four-engine job. And we had two engines go out on it, and I could hear it, and they couldn't start them. But we made it back to the United States. Mm -hmm. But back then, I could imagine those flights every day, back and forth, back and forth, nonstop. Yeah. You know. And uh, you were discharged. 
Did you uh, make use of the, were you eligible for the GI Bill? Yes, I was. I and never did nothing with the GI Bill. No, did, you didn't buy a house or anything? Or no, when I did buy a house, you know, they wouldn't, uh, they gave you a hard time. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So it was like so much paperwork and stuff like that that I didn't even bother. Okay. You know. Did you, uh, did you join any veterans organizations at all? Yes, I belong to the I belong to the VFW, and I joined the American Legion Post 216 here in Barberville, mm -hmm. and I've been here ever since. Okay. And uh, did you stay in contact with any of the guys you served with? A couple of them, but all of a sudden I just lost them. I don't know what happened after we all got married. We all went separate ways. Basically, mm -hmm. it was a couple of guys in uh, California that I knew, mm -hmm. and Ohio. But I never got back to him. I always look in the magazine to see if I could find anything going yeah. on. But never. I even went on the computer, but can't find nobody. So, so you didn't attend any kind of Reunion. reunions, or no? You don't. You don't belong to the any of the the like most of the divisions have like a website or. Well, yeah. I went on there on the website yeah. with some of them. There's Alpha Company there. It's got a beautiful thing on there. One of the guys, his name is Lopez. Mm -hmm. He put it on. He was with me. Uh, and I was in Bravo Company at the time, but what he wrote down was the truth what was going on because every company was there, Alpha, mm -hmm. Bravo, Charlie, everyone, and headquarters. That was the whole thing. How, how were you treated by, you, you said you joined the VFW and the Legion. Did you, did you join shortly after you came back from Korea or? No. Years later? Way, a while later. Okay. Because I felt, you know, the way it was, when I got back home from the United States, at that time when I got back to the United States, nobody even recognized us, you know what I'm saying? With mm -hmm. the, I don't know if you went through it or if anybody went through it, that they actually, you know, basically spit on us. Mm -hmm. The only incident I had was on a flight coming from um, Seattle, Washington. One of the stewardess, when I was coming back to New York, turned around and told me, uh, you know, we, we, she seen I was in uniform and she put me into first class. Oh. And I couldn't believe it, you know. And she says, you know, she was proud of what we did you know, what the guy's doing over there. Mm -hmm. And she happened to be one of the first, but the other people when they come back, they didn't care nothing about us, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The only thing I got a hardship with is uh, the guys that went to Canada. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that bothers me to this day. They went to Canada, and then they made them come back to, you know, to yeah. the United States, and they told them that they could stay here. Meantime, all the guys that were in Nam or wherever they went that died for this country, these guys live free. We could have been one of those guys instead. Yeah. So that's the only thing I have the hardship about. Mm -hmm. That's why they call it America. But mm -hmm. I mean, I, I went. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Well, let me put it this way. I wouldn't let my son join the service. Um, sometimes you have good times, but when you're in a battle, you know, or when you're in a third-rate country or whatever you want to call it and you see the way they live and you live that way for 14 months like I did where I ate dog and I didn't even know it or cat and I ate food and I just couldn't believe it and then when you come back and you do things and the government don't even help you mm -hmm. that's where I lost respect don't get me wrong I have respect for the country but it's the idea like all these bureaucrats you want to call them with all this paperwork that's the thing that bothers me mm -hmm. I mean guys fought and I think they deserve it. There's a lot of World War II veterans around here that have more respect than I've ever seen in my life, that deserve stuff and never got nothing. They say mm -hmm. it's Vietnam guys and, you know, Korea the DMZ. That's why I don't even go to, um, they have a dinner over here, breakfast in the morning for the, you know, the kids have here. I have never went yet mm -hmm. because I feel that I don't, you know, deserve to go, you know, sometimes. It's in my mind. But this year, I think I'm going to go because my mm -hmm. granddaughter asked me, you know, how come you don't go where far? You know, because mm -hmm. she goes to the school. So I told him next year I'll go. Okay. Maybe it's the way I feel. I don't know. Okay. But I wouldn't let my son join because of this reason. I mean, if the government backed us up, instead of lying about things, and then all of a sudden, 20 years, 30 years later, turn around and say, well, this is what we did. I mean, why do we got to find it out this way? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything else you want to talk about that uh, we may have missed or didn't touch on? No, I think you touched on everything. Basic was was you know good, mm -hmm. you know the stuff that they did in basic training. You know, mm -hmm. the uh, you know they where they where they treat you. Do you do you think you were you were through your training you were 
prepared adequately for Korea? Well, prepared adequately? Well, let me put it this way. I got there, I learned. Mm -hmm. When you're in the States, you do this, you're not out in the cold, you go to base, you're not in the environment that you're in until you get overseas. Mm -hmm. That's when you learn. And you learn from the other guys, the other soldiers that are over there that have been there for a year. And you actually age within that year. That's how you can tell, you know, you're young, and then all of a sudden you look at yourself, the way you change, how old you got. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's maturing or you know everything or what's going on, but that's what happened with me. That's what I felt. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Thank you. Hey, you've got a couple photographs or one yeah. photo? I got a photograph of me when I first. Uh, if you hold that back towards you, I can zoom in on it. Okay. Okay, it's a, I'm getting a little bit of glare. Can you hold? Okay, right there. That's pretty good. Can you tilt it forward just a little bit? Okay, that's, I think that's about as good as we're going to get. And what, when and where was that taken? I was in Korea when I first got there. Okay. You know, and I was there, that's how young I looked over there. How okay. young I was. And then my second picture is the first winter that I was over there. I don't know if you could see it. Okay. All right. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yep. And that's, uh, you know, I started getting older and that, you know, rugged look. And after that, before I came out, my hair was long. I was like, a, you know, as well say a hippie. We didn't have hair. You know, we just let our hair grow. We had beards and everything. They didn't bother us down there. That's the only mm -hmm. thing I could say when I was over in the DMZ zone. Everything changed. Uniforms and everything. We wore shorts in the summertime because it was so hot. And when we went to church, we did it out of a Jeep. Mm -hmm. And they, they would come up to priest or whatever, and that was it. But it was, you know... It's something I will never forget. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well, thank you so much. Thank you, sir.